Hi everyone and welcome to our video on transport tissues. So this is the second video in our little transport implant series and what we're going to be doing here is looking at the specification reference 3.1.3b part 1 which is the structure and function of the vascular system in the root stems and leaves of our dicotyledonous plants. So the first type of tissue we're going to look at is going to be the xylem. Hopefully we remember from GCSE and from our A-level studies that when we're talking about xylem, we are talking about the tissue that is going to be transporting water and mineral ions. How do we remember this? We're just going to go with the alphabet. Water, W in xylem, XY. So water in xylem, WXY, gives us our little mental note that we can make to help us remember this. If we know that we got the water, hopefully we will make the common link that we have got mineral ions being transported as well. Key thing here is that our xylem is only transporting these substances up the plant. So they're only moving from the roots up to the leaves. There is a second feature of our xylem aside from transporting water and mineral ions, and that is that it provides this structural support to the plant. If you get a question asking you about basically the function of our xylem, then you're not going to get individual marks for transport water and transport mineral ions usually. They kind of fall under the same marking point. So go with one transport and then go with structural support for your second one, just to be super safe to make sure you always get those marks. If we now have a look at some of those adaptations that our xylem vessels actually have to allow them to carry out this transport and structural support function. So first thing is that when our xylem vessels actually develop, then this substance called lignin is going to actually then be laid into those cell walls. And as a result of that, it makes them waterproof. Now, the key thing to remember here is that when we're talking about our xylem and the lignin, make sure that you say that the cell walls have been lignified. Don't just say the xylem as a whole has been lignified. Make sure we're being specific and saying it's the cell walls that have had the lignin impregnated, that they've become um, coated with lignin even. That should be absolutely fine. Just make sure it's the cell walls in there. Now, the name of this process is quite common sense. It's called lignification. Now, what we actually find is the lignin, when it is being actually impregnated into these cell walls, is going to form specific patterns. So sometimes we get this little spiral set up, as we can see in the middle there. So spiral because it forms a little spiral running right the way down. We can get an annular arrangement, which basically means it's in these little rings or we can get a reticulate structure, which is broken rings. Now, what we actually have and the reason for this patterning that we get with our lignin is all about flexibility. So we can't just literally cover the whole thing with the lignin. If we did that, then it would actually be far too rigid. So we've got to have this little pattern with the lignin to allow for flexibility so that that branch or the stem can actually bend. The downside to adding our lignin is it's going to kill the cells. So what we're dealing with with xylem are dead cells. They are no longer living because they have been lignified. However, it does provide support and obviously prevents that collapse of the xylem when water's in short supply. Because it's quite a rigid structure, that means those vessels are not going to collapse in on themselves if they're not filled with water itself. One thing that make sure you are able to do is recognise our little xylem vessel from a microscope image like we've got here. So what we can actually make out here, if you look along this little section, then we can actually see those little bits of lignin. So each of these bits is the actual lignin that we've got in there. So this would be a xylem vessel. We can see the lignin in the walls and that's how we can identify it. The other feature to remember about our xylem vessels is they no longer have these end walls. 
So whereas you might think about having a whole load of these are very simple cells, I'm literally drawing boxes with their little end walls. They are no longer there when it comes to our xylem. These end walls have all been broken down. And when we've broken down those end walls, we've also removed the cell contents. So basically we've changed from all these cells stacked end to end to just a nice long continuous hollow tube. Why do we do that? Because it's going to remove that resistance to the flow of water. So that means that rather than having to cross all these little end walls, the water and those mineral ions are then free to flow as that one continuous column. Think back to that work you would have done right away in module two on water. If we think about our water molecules, obviously they're all these little structures of two hydrogens and an oxygen. Hopefully we remember that our hydrogens are delta positive, oxygens are the delta negative, so they've got a slight positive and slight negative charge, which then means that we're going to get those little hydrogen bonds forming between the oxygen of one and the hydrogen of another. So when that happens, we're then going to form that continuous chain, if you remember, and that is how it's going to flow as this continuous column up the xylem vessels. So we get a link back to our biomolecules work here. One thing we should also remember is that not all areas of the xylem are fully lignified. We've got this partial lignification in some areas, leaving these structures called a bordered pit. Now, the bordered pits are basically going to be lined up in two adjacent cells so that it's then going to allow this lateral movement of water. So where we've actually got a couple of our xylem vessels basically side by side, then what we're able to do with these bordered pits is allow the water to move from one into the other. Really important if you were to think about there being some kind of a blockage in one of those xylem vessels here, then it means that the water can just cross into a different xylem vessel and continue its way up the plant. The second type of tissue we need to know about then is phloem. Now phloem is all to do with transporting the assimilates, so they would be sucrose and amino acids for example. And these are moving in the direction from the source to the sink. Please just use that phrase from source to sink. Now, what we're going to find is that could either be moving up the plant or it could be moving down the plant. So we've got this two directional travel in the phloem. When we actually consider what our phloem tissue is made up of, we have these things called sieve tubes and these are made of sieve tube elements and the companion cells. So if we look at our little diagram on the right here, we've got our sieve tube elements to the right of that diagram, and then our companion cells are these bluish colored ones kind of stuck on the side of the sieve tube element, if you will. Now, those sieve tube elements are actually going to be lined up end to end to form the sieve tube itself. And rather than having solid end walls, these ones actually have these things called sieve plates. So basically, rather than having a complete end wall, what we've done is got one that has these perforations. So basically, this is just going to allow these larger molecules easier movement through that tube. They don't have a nucleus and they've got very little cytoplasm. Reason for that, it creates more space for this mass flow of the sap to actually occur. If we had a nucleus, if we had loads of cytoplasm in there, we'd restrict the space and therefore we'd impede that mass flow process. Next thing to bear in mind is that the sieve tubes have very thin walls. And when we actually look at them in this transverse section under the microscope, if you have a look down here, then they actually appear to be five or six sided. So if you have a little look, you can see one of them is here. So if we have a look, we can go one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can always pick out those sides to them, five or six usually, and that will be one of our little sieve tubes. If we were to have a situation where our plant experienced some kind of 
damage or an infection, it's going to be really important that there is a technique to try to minimize the loss of either the sap from the phloem itself or to reduce the spread of pathogens through that vascular tissue. And the way that this is achieved is by depositing a substance called callos. So basically, if our plant experiences some kind of injury or infection, then callos is going to be deposited in those sieve plates and basically it seals it up. So if you imagine we've got a little tube here, we've got a little sieve plates, we've got those gaps in it. If there's some kind of damage occurring, so if we were to put a little nick in here, then all that's going to happen is we're going to deposit the callos across our little plate. And as a result of that, we're going to seal off that particular tube. What we then find is that between the sieve tubes, we've got these structures called companion cells. And the companion cells are going to be really important because these cells have a large nucleus and a dense cytoplasm, so quite different to our sieve tube elements. And they're going to have lots of mitochondria present. And hopefully we remember that mitochondria are all to do with, obviously, this process of aerobic respiration. And hopefully we remember that aerobic respiration is all to do with actually producing our ATP. So any of these areas of plants or animals that have these quite high demands for ATP are going to have more mitochondria present to allow them to then produce the ATP, which is then going to be used in these active processes. And these companion cells are going to be involved in an active process. When we actually compare our xylem and our phloem, then we need to be able to give some similarities and some differences. So watch out for these questions that do ask you to write a comparison that you don't just focus on the differences. Make sure you state some of the similarities as well. So the three similarities I'd suggest that you know. Firstly, they're both made of cells which are joined end to end. Secondly, they are complex tissues. And finally, they do have these sieve tube elements in the phloem and xylem itself that lack cell contents. So there's regions of the phloem and the entirety of the xylem that lack cell contents. If we come on to the differences then, our xylem is lignified, whereas phloem is not. Xylem has no end walls, whereas the phloem just has those sieve plates instead. No companion cells in xylem, but they are present in the phloem. No sieve tube elements in xylem, but sieve tube elements are present in the phloem. And there are bordered pits in our xylem, but no pits in the phloem. If you learn those three similarities and this little table of differences, then whatever question you get asking you to do any form of comparison or even just describing some of those adaptations of xylem and phloem, you've got from these couple of slides. So really good to just try and recreate those in your own notes. As always, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you can see when I next upload another video. And of course, head on over to my A-Level Biology website where you can find a range of other resources all aimed at helping you with your A-Level Biology studies.